You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. Chapter 1 of the Gospel According to Matthew. Alright, we're moving into the account of the birth of Jesus. And you'll notice in Matthew, there's not a whole lot of stuff until you get to to Matthew 2. But we're not going to get into all of that today. We're just going to finish Matthew 1, alright? And then next week, I'm sort of just going to talk about... Jesus as the the rock not made by human hands, the mustard seed, the leaven, the that stream uh, that Ezekiel sees that starts with a trickle, then goes to ankle to knees to all the way it consumes him. This is Jesus. This is the gospel. That's the kingdom. All right, the kingdom of God, His rule and reign, His power and authority. And so I'll, I'll probably just sort of sort of just ramble and rant on a few of those things next next week you know we're gonna have some christmas songs and hopefully everybody's gonna be healthy <laughs> and so we're gonna have some music with uh olivia and paul and hillary and then well, i'm gonna do my little like the kingdom of god thing it's here it's spiritual but it's not all these other things that people say and then we'll do the lord's uh supper which is in his communion obviously and just sort of celebrate Christmas like that. Uh, I think it'll be good. So, uh, as I said, we're all this, then the birth, right? The birth of Jesus. This, it should be fresh in our minds uh, because it's Christmas, right? And Christmas time is for, Christ, uh, for Christians is all about celebrating Jesus, right? The birth of our Savior. Uh, a lot, though, a lot of what we we think we know has been shaped by movies and songs and all that. And I'm not this year not debunking all these things like I did last year and everything like that. You know, <laughs> so you, you should know those already. All right, but there's a lot of important details that have either been lost, they've been modified, or just completely changed from what is in the Bible. So thankfully, we have our Bibles that we can can uh, look to and refresh our minds. So we're picking up where we left off last week. It's Matthew chapter 1, and uh, we'll look at 18 and 19 first. Here it says, Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being just being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, Resolved to divorce her quietly. All right. So, as I said last week, right, that uh, Matthew's story is from Joseph's point of view. It's Joseph's perspective. It's not Mar- most of the time we we hear from Mary's. I thought it'd be interesting to go this route uh, this year. So now, only only assumption can really say what Joseph is thinking here. Or, and what's going on? Obviously, he know or he is thinking though that she has been unfaithful, right? She's pregnant. Uh, he or she has cheated on him, and that he he feels this way or the other. We don't know about that. We don't know what he's feeling. Only that he wants to divorce her. But the the text really doesn't say any of this stuff. So it's only assumption. We can only uh, come to that conclusion by thinking uh, of of that situation. Matthew only mentions that Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit. And now Joseph is going to divorce her and do so in a way that would not put her to shame. And now this is important. All right. Now the text says divorce, but we know they were betrothed. All right. That is a unique premarital status in this culture. Okay. It's not like being engaged is today, but it's still a step short of being married, all right? So basically, 
the family of a woman of marrying age would negotiate with the family of an eligible bachelor. This is how it worked then, okay? They would arrange a marriage, okay? The family of the man had to pay the family of the lady, okay, for the price of the bride. <laughs> Seems very archaic. This stuff still happens, though, today in other cultures. All right, now, the price, though, the price needed to be generous. If the groom's family tried to bargain down the price of the bride, that would suggest that they thought that the girl was not very desirable. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. <laughs> but that's the truth. And that would be an offensive thing, right? Eventually, though, the two families, they come to an agreement on a price. A deal is struck for marriage, okay? So at that point, then, the bride was betrothed to her groom, even though the two may have never even known each other or met. Now, because money was exchanged, though, this betrothal is a legal arrangement, all right? That's why it's not like engagement. People can get engaged today, and then they can call off the engagement, all right? There's no legal process or anything like that. It's just, okay, this isn't, we're done, right? Give me my ring back. It's just sort of like what happens today. Not then. This is a legal arrangement. So legally speaking, the couple had entered into a preliminary form of marriage at this point. Months later, then, a formal marriage ceremony was, would take place where the couple officially becomes husband and wife. And only at that time, the couple would consummate their marriage in the marriage tent. And it takes place at the reception, which is like a week long. All right, so there's just like this curtain and the marriage tent behind the curtain, and they go in and they do uh, that stuff. <laughs> when you get to, you know, celebrate being married. And then they still are celebrating this reception. It's like a week long thing. All right, so that's the situation that's going on here at this point. They're betrothed, okay? Which means they have not yet formally married, uh, much less been together when it says that. <clears throat> um, before they came together. That's what it says in the text. So during this period, Mary turns up pregnant. And we know from Luke's gospel that Mary initially went to spend time with her cousin, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist at this time. So she stayed with Elizabeth a few months before returning home. And maybe, depending at that point, her pregnancy could maybe is just a small baby bump, maybe, at that point. So she knew she was going to have to tell Joseph, like, she's got to tell him, right? It's going to start to show here. All right, now had come the time that we read. So Mary tells Joseph that she's with child, but she, she doesn't say, like, by saying it's by the Holy Spirit, it, that is quickly denying being unfaithful to Joseph. Because she's... It's as if she's saying, it's not what you're thinking. This is because of God. It's the Holy Spirit. God made me pregnant, basically, right? So that's what we're dealing with. So jo Joseph plans on divorcing Mary, okay? That's probably the natural response here, right? But he decides to do so secretly. And by secretly, it means that he wasn't going to press charges against her. Okay, you guys have to understand that too. They are under Mosaic law, all right? Under Mosaic law, Mary had committed a, a crime that's punishable by death by stoning. If you want to look that up later, it's in Deuteronomy 22. So Joseph, being a righteous man, could not marry a woman he believed to be immoral. But at the same time, his righteousness led him to show this mercy to Mary by protecting her, her reputation and protecting her life from being stoned. So he planned to take her somewhere away from her home, somewhere where she wouldn't be recognized, so he could then issue her a writ of divorce, okay? So let's consider what Mary it would be thinking here when she hears that Joseph is divorcing her. Because... In these types of sermons at this time, it's always like, you cheated on me. No, I didn't. We're doing that. It's always some sort of knockdown, drag out fight, or what are you thinking? Blah, 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 and all the assumption. It's not in the text. 
people would assume she's freaking out now because she, she's going to get divorced. And now she's pregnant, right? From Luke's gospel, though, we know she had been visited by an angel to learn her, this news of this pregnancy. She knows she's never been with a man, but she can clearly see there's a child growing inside of her now at this point. She was also told that her baby would be that long-promised Messiah, right? All that we looked at last week in the genealogy. That Savior that God has been promising to deliver to mankind since the fall of Adam in the garden. Right? There's no more important event in all human history than this birth of the Messiah, right? And God has placed Mary in the center of it all. So Mary's absolutely convinced that her pregnancy is a miracle that's been ordained by God because she believes. Yet when she shares this news with Joseph, he doesn't believe her. All right. So what I would address is the question, do you suppose Mary wondered if God was failing her at this moment? Right. Did she cry out demanding why God wasn't keeping her marriage together? When she was serving him in this in this call, right? Perhaps she supposed supposed that God lacked the power to save her marriage, or that God didn't even care about it, right? But the answer to all that is no. I don't think so. I don't think so at all because the text is silent silent on Mary's response. But I don't believe she thought any of those things. And I think that because of the account we have in Luke, it seems that she remained confident in God that despite Joseph's decision of this writ of divorce, that she knew God would would protect her marriage somehow. Right. I believe she responded in faith and I'm not going to go down that whole like respond in faith type of message, but I believe it's her faith in the words that she received. Right. Right. With a quiet confidence that no matter how bleak, no matter how dark your situation appears to be, and in her case, this, she's pregnant, and now her her soon-to-be husband does not want to marry her, that she knows she's placed faith in what's been in the promise that's been given to her, that God had a good purpose in what was happening. So I think we can come to that view then by just re- re- reading how she responded to the angel when she first learned of God's plan, and that's in Luke 1, and it's 38, 31 through 38. And it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. It's good eschaton there. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called will be called holy, the son of God. I mentioned it last year in in the Greek. This is like the Shekinah glory that would would come upon her to make in this process. Thirty six. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age (laughs) has has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her uh, with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, and here it is. Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. There you go. And the angel departed from her. Mary hears the impossible that she will have a baby, even though she's a virgin. And when Mary asks the angel how this can be, the angel responds, for nothing will be impossible with God. To which Mary responds then, or cries out, let it be to me according to your word. That's why I don't think she's freaking out about Joseph's reaction. Let it be. In other words, Mary accepted in faith what she had been told by the angel, knowing God's word was certain and true. She believed that God could do impossible things, right? She knew it. She 
she's picked for some reason here, but she was a good Jewish girl, I guess, right? She probably knew the history. She knew everything. She had faith in what the message said. So really think about it when you have these people that have these assumptions and all these things, how foolish it would have been for Mary to actually look down at that baby bump knowing that she was a virgin and then complain to God that he's ruined the marriage. Does it make sense really? Right? Hasn't God proven his love for us sufficiently even in those times? Because he had. Hasn't he already demonstrated his power to solve any problem he chooses to do so? Of course he has. So the real issue is, are we willing to accept things his way, even when we don't understand it or like it? That's really what it comes down to, I believe. And I think that gets in that whole sovereignty thing and it's a big old can of worms. (laughs) Right? It's complicated. There's only so much we can understand. But we know that God has given us his son. We know that God has forgiven us. We know we've been reconciled, right? So it's a whole other message. But we know, even if we don't understand it, and there's some things in life we don't like, but we know God is God. And it's not always him, though. That's the other thing, right? It's not always him that's causing all these things. I'm going to rant if I get off. But can't we trust him to be working on our behalf? I believe we can. We know God doesn't solve every problem in our life or give us everything that we want, right? I'm not telling you he will because he's not, all right? The Bible does not tell us that. (laughs) But the Bible does say that God can work all circumstances in the lives of believers to arrive at eternally good things for us and for his glory. So God gave Mary the blessing to birth this Messiah, this Jesus, right? So how could she then declare that God wasn't good to her? She couldn't have. I just don't think it's there. What better thing could she have received, actually? And if God could supernaturally conceive a child in her womb as a virgin, then she should know that he had the capability of keeping her marriage together, right? (laughs) In other words, God had already proven himself to Mary to be good and to be powerful. So Mary had every reason to just stay quietly confident in him and in the promise that was given to her by the angel, even as Joseph declared that he was divorcing her. All right. So I believe, too, then we know as well that God is good and that he can do anything. That's the approach of faith. God has already given us. The blessing of his son dying on a cross to pay, forgive our sins. That's sufficient evidence right there to know that God is good all the time. Right. Can we ever say that God has not been good to us? No. Moving on. Matthew 1, 20 through 25. I had a drink. Now, back to Joseph. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. All right. So he gets an angel to talk to him now, too. This is the God showing up here. And he's, he's showing up to correct Joseph's thinking, actually. The angel addresses Joseph as son of David, right? Now, we learned last week that's, that's a title that points back to that Davidic covenant, right? That covenant promised Israel that a descendant of David would occupy the throne forever, 
So Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise, right? He is the eternal king who rules over the world in the kingdom. And Joseph is in the line of David leading to Jesus. So the angel draws Joseph's attention to that bigger plan by calling him the son of David. So this is a wake up call, I guess you would call it for Joseph. Joseph's mind was focused on himself, right? It's focused on himself at that point, considering how to divorce his wife, how to save his reputation. He was nursing his feelings of betrayal and hurt. And I know that's probably assumptions like and I'm not contradicting what I said earlier, but that's something that's going on because he wants to divorce her, but he wants to do so quietly. But it's as if he's given no thought to Mary's explanation regarding the Holy Spirit, except to just dismiss it out of hand. Right. So the angels waking Joseph up so he might think about bigger things than just himself and just his reputation. And in verse 21, the, the angel explains to Joseph that his wife, uh, that his wife to be was going to bear this son conceived of the Holy Spirit, whom they would name Jesus. His son would be the Messiah, the one God promised to send to save his people, right, from their sins. This child was to be the key to saving humanity from eternal death. And as Joseph hears the angel in his dream, it begins to sink in that the world didn't revolve around him and his problems at that moment, right? The Messiah's arrival was going to require that Joseph be willing to marry a woman who got pregnant out of wedlock. That's a sacrifice for both Joseph and Mary. That seems to be the, the requirement from God here, though, of his bondservant, right? And that's not a small request in this day and time that when this happened. Not at all. Given how hard it was for Joseph to accept Mary's story of a virgin birth, can you imagine how hard uh, it would have been to convince other people of this? All right? This is like in the 50s and like 40s, 50s, and 60s when there's a bunch of seven month babies being born <laughs> right <clears throat> it it in a in a strict culture like ancient, ancient Judea that that was a scandal and it didn't go unnoticed right so so the angel tells Joseph not to fear taking Mary as his wife she's not been unfaithful so go on with these marriage plans the reason Mary's pregnant is just as she had told him, just as she explained, she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Now, that is a completely unavoidable, unavoidable mystery to us. I don't know how it happened. doesn't really matter. We understand that it happened, but we can't explain it. Biologically speaking, right? Why? It's a miracle. <laughs> That's what's going on here. But why? Why the, why the supernatural conception? Right. For one, it's a fulfillment of the prophecy that we that the angel mentioned, and that's from Isaiah. He quotes Isaiah seven, and this was hundreds of years earlier. Right. And it says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So the prophet had told Israel hundreds of years before that the Lord would send his people a unique sign to indicate when their Messiah had come to them. That sign would be this virgin birth. But again, you have to ask the question, why do we use this particular sign? Anyone question that? I mean, has ever, anyone ever wonder that? Why the virgin birth? Right? God could have used any sign he wanted to. It seems like he could have went about this in any way that he wanted to as well, right? But it's a virgin birth that leads to a gruesome death that leads to a resurrection. I think the full answer is at the, the end of verse 23 when the angel tells Joseph that child will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us, right? Right? The angel was saying that people will say this about Jesus, that he is God. He is God with us. And that's why Jesus required this virgin birth. 
And to, to explain that, we, you go all the way back. We're not going to read the text. We have spent so many, so many Sundays before in, in Genesis at the beginning. <laughs> but you go all the way to the beginning. You go to that moment of the very first human sin, all right? We know the fall. God told Adam that, 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 uh, God told Adam that should he ever disobey his word, that Adam's sin would result in him dying spiritually, and I believe I've made my solid case for that, but it's a spiritual death, not physical. And to die spiritually is the separation from God's presence, right? And this is the penalty that God pronounced in advance for sin, and it became fulfilled. God had also decreed man and woman to reproduce, right? Be fruitful, fill, multiply the earth, right? Fill the earth. God also required all creatures, including humanity, should reproduce after their own kind or nature. Right? So, so what we are is what we will reproduce. And this is applied physically. Right? And the spiritual death is there as well. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They became spiritually dead, just as God said they would. And their spiritual nature changed Right, becoming slaves to that sin nature. And as that federal headship of, of all humanity, this is something we're all born into then, right? Born into that of Adam. So thankfully, that's not where that story ends. We know that. The Bible also tells us that God so loved the world that he determined to make a way available for us to avoid that fate of staying spiritually dead and eternal death by his mercy. And his grace to us that he sent his son, Jesus, for this, right? To die for the sin and then reconciling the world to himself. That Jesus came to give his life to free us from spiritual death. And the chance to have eternal life and to, to not experience eternal death. That if we believe in him and his death, we would receive that gift of eternal life. Rather than the judgment of eternal death, which we have all deserve, I believe. That's the gospel. That's the message of salvation. But if Jesus' death was to be accepted, right? That accepted substitute in our place. Then it was essential that Jesus not have sin of his own, right? If Jesus had been born in the nature of Adam... He then would have inherited Adam's sin nature just like all of us. Right? Remember last week? Adam is not his physical father. He has no uh, earthly father like we do. <clears throat> so if Jesus were born with that sin nature, then Jesus, uh, he would have he been just as guilty as us, as sinners, Right? His death would have merely, I, well, it would have done nothing. I mean, maybe it could have been a payment for himself, but I don't even think that would have worked. <laughs> it couldn't have been useful as a payment to cover the sin of the world, right? So G Jesus was fully human, right? We know this. He was fully human, but he was also fully God. Jesus was no less a human being than you and I, but he's greater than us are in that one sense. Although we had an earthly father that made us like him, right? Jesus was like Adam. He has no earthly father. These are the only two people in the world that have no earthly father, Adam and Jesus, right? Right? So just as Adam's body came to life because God breathed into him. Remember that? Breathing into him, that Ruach, right? Is that how you say it? You always correct me if I get it wrong. That, that the Father conceived Jesus by the Holy Spirit. It was by the Spirit that God gave Adam life. And God conceives Jesus supernaturally. Therefore, Jesus didn't descend from Adam. He descended from God. Right? So in Jesus restarted the human race then as that new Adam we've talked about, and the second Adam, right? That's why the, the Bible calls him the second Adam. He has no earthly father. 
That's why our Savior had to come through the virgin birth like this, incarnate. He has to be physical, but he has to be without sin. He's fully human, but at the same time, he's fully God. That's, that's the hypostatic union. That's what it's called in theology. And that's why our Savior comes from that then. That's why he could be a human being, yet remain free from that sin nature that we have all inherited being born of Adam. Having been born without sin, Jesus then goes on to live life without ever repeating Adam's mistake, right? Jesus never disobeyed the Father. Jesus was without sin. He experienced the temptation to sin, but unlike Adam, he never gives into that temptation. We know this, right? There's something about that. I mean, seriously, when people say, well, it's the Holy Spirit that enabled him to do this. The Holy Spirit doesn't come upon him until he's 30. Just say it. I just want to say, I was thinking while you were saying that, because I was like, how can you lay aside the very part of your being? Right. Because it's, sorry, it's probably what you're getting at. No, no. Mm-hmm. So that's what I was just thinking. How can you possibly lay aside your divinity? Yeah. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't lay aside your divinity. Like, well, you can't. Oh, uh, so yeah. He couldn't. <laughs> he couldn't. He would cease to be divine. But the Holy Spirit didn't, dis- like I said, didn't descend upon him until he's 30 years old when he gets baptized. He, sa- he goes 30 years with no sin. Why? Because he he is human, but he's got something that's not common with us. Born with no sin nature. He's not born of Adam. He was born of God. So anybody that just says (laughs) that stuff, that's that kenosis stuff. I don't like it. Uh, (laughs) It's popular today. But all of this then leads, though, that when when Jesus went to the death on the cross, he suffered a death he didn't deserve. He didn't commit any sin. Therefore, his death could become enough for us. All right. To remove the sin, to forgive the sin, spiritually resurrect us from that spiritual death and to reconcile us to God. That Jesus could serve as that perfect sinless sacrifice for us and as the high priest at the same time, right? So, Christmas is the celebration of the birth of the Savior, but the birth leads to the death, right? The death leads to the resurrection. You you just can't ignore it. You know, I can't just teach about the Savior being born without why. And what it leads to. So it, it sounds like an Easter sermon some too. But it's, it's there. You, you have to have it. It goes together, right? So Joseph awoke from his dream. He accepted the angel's revelation. He acts in faith then. And Matthew says that Joseph took Mary as his wife. And he sets a date for the wedding. He enters into that covenant prior to Jesus' birth. And in doing so, he ensured that Jesus would legally be his descendant just as God intended. Yet Joseph also respected the place that Mary had in this plan that God had given them and the need for her to remain a virgin during this time. That's why it says we're told that he refrained from consummating the marriage until after Jesus' birth. So she's acting in faith. She's walking in faith. He's acting in faith and walking in faith too, believing these reports, and they did what was required of God's plan. And this is the story of the Savior coming into the world that was so promised over and over again in types and shadows and prophecies in the Old Testament that he is that stone that's not cut by human hands. That's what, you know, he has no earthly father. He has a heavenly father. Right? He is God uh, with us. 
He's not God like us. <laughs> In respect to so many ways, all right? And, th- and this is that story. And this is what we celebrate. So uh, next week, we'll just talk about that, Je- like the gospel and Jesus and who he is and how it fill, will fill the earth. It will con- continue to grow and continue to spread in a kingdom with no end, right? Are there any questions or comments?